our next paper uh, in talking about performance evaluation is uh, by Jonathan Burke, Five Myths of Active Portfolio Management. Uh, that paper is a short summary of a number of uh, deeper and harder papers by Jonathan with Rick Green and some other co-authors as well. The world we've seen so far is deeply puzzling and deeply troubling. Uh, the Fama and French paper summarizes 45 years of academic research that, that without a hitch has found horrible performance in actively managed mutual funds, hedge funds, and actively managed investments. The alphas are negative about corresponding to the fees. It looks like the investments are like uh, uh, throwing darts. Uh, what we saw in Carhartt, uh, the performance of, of good funds at best lasts a year, and even that seems to be explained by momentum and just comes down to the momentum in the underlying stocks. Uh, yet um, investors, uh, even, the, even though we know performance doesn't last, investors uh, not only choose high fee active management, but they chase past returns. Here's a graph of that fact from a, a very nice paper by Judy Chevalier and Glenn Ellison. We've graphed here last year's return versus flow of funds in, uh, into uh, mutual funds, and, and the graph just tells you what you know if you read the newspaper. Uh, funds that did very well last year uh, get a lot more money uh, this year. That's for small funds. This is for older, larger funds. Uh, if you do well, you get a lot of money, but it doesn't make any sense that doing well should lead to a lot of money since we've just shown that do last year's doing well doesn't tell you much at all about performance uh, in the future. Furthermore, managers are paid an enormous amount in a very competitive market. And, and though academia discovered awful performance 50 years ago, index funds were invented in the 1970s, um, this is hardly news, but, but sophisticated investors, university endowments, sovereign wealth funds, um, uh, many large portfolios, they're all becoming more high fee and active. They're investing in hedge funds and, and other high fee active investments rather than just indexing. Now, just to say this is folly, irrationality, and stupidity uh, just doesn't make much sense. Um, why don't we try to explain these phenomena in a normal competitive market. I think nobody did that because they didn't figure out how for 50 years, but Burke and Green have done so. They show us a, a simple way that all of these puzzling phenomena can emerge in a normal competitive market. And I'll boil it down to just an example. The, the papers are uh, much more sophisticated and, and take the obvious issues to heart, but let's look at a simple example of, of how this could work. Suppose a manager has 6% alpha. You really can earn 6% alpha, but it's a limited scale. The manager can only earn 6% alpha on $10 million of investment. So if he has $10 million, he can earn $600,000 a year of his alpha. Uh, beyond that, uh, it becomes a crowded trade, uh, price impact, and so forth. So any additional money, the investor will simply uh, put in the index and earn zero alpha or, on the additional money. And the fund charges 1% of assets under management, which is standard mutual fund fee. So what happens? In year one, the fund starts with $10 million. Uh, he, the manager earns 6% and returns 5% uh, returns, uh, of that to investors, keeping the 1% fee for himself. So the fund earns 600 grand, the manager gets 100, and uh, returns 500 grand to investors. Investors see that and say, wow, this guy knows what he's doing. Uh, we will uh, give him more money, a perfectly rational thing for the investors to do. So year two, uh, let's suppose the fund goes up to 20 million assets under management. Now what happens? The, the manager earns 6% on the first 10 million, but the second 10 million he just stuffs in the index. But now the it has 20% assets under management, so the fee that the fund will earn uh, is now going to be $200,000, not the $100,000 that it was going to earn the first time around. So what happens now? The fund still earns the same 600 grand. The manager gets 200 grand. The investors get 400 grand. Well, it's still a good deal, right? This guy knows what he's doing, or, or gal knows what she's doing. Let's keep giving them more money. Where does this stop? Well, in either year three or week three, I don't know which one it is. It depends how fast this happens. When the fund has 60 million assets under management, it still earns 6% on the first 10 million and puts the remaining 50 million in the index. It charges, however, 1% of $60 million, the full 600 grand. 
So investors get zero alpha, but zero alpha is what they can earn on the index. So there's no reason for in investors to leave. And if the investors do leave, the alpha goes back up again and brings more alpha back in. So where does this stop? In the end, the, firm, firm, uh, the fund earns 600 grand. The manager gets it. Investors get no alpha, but that's their equilibrium rate of return. And, and the fees balance the alpha. Now, let's, let's think about this story and, and what phenomenon this story, this, this story generates all of the things that, that we thought were puzzling. And the way Burke and Green put this is, is to, uh, the way Burke puts this is to list the five hypotheses that we took for granted and that underlay the discussion we had when talking about Carhartt and Fama French. We were looking at, at returns alpha uh, to investors as a measure of skill. But of course, in this example, uh, the returns to investors are zero in the end. The measure of skill is the amount that the fund manager earns. And that's not just alpha, it's alpha times assets under management. This investor, this, uh, this fund in the end is only earning 1% alpha of its total assets under management. But the skill is the ability to earn the 6% alpha uh, on the first 10 million. So that was wrong. Returns to alpha to investors does not measure skill. Alpha doesn't measure skill. Alpha times assets under management measures skill. Uh, average returns don't beat the market, so the average manager is not skilled. Again, that's not true in this example. Uh, if the manager has skill, returns uh, in, in the sense of alpha should persist. That's, that's what we've been looking for all along, yet that's not true in this example. The alpha, is, the alpha to investors is zero. In fact, it declines very quickly to zero and then stays at zero. Since returns don't persist, we've said, investors who follow past returns are irrational. That's exactly uh, what the charge was when we looked at the Chevalier Ellison's graphs. Returns don't persist, so you guys are being nuts by giving the managers more money. Well, no. In this example, that's exactly the right thing to do. You give the, uh, you, you give the manager more money in response to past returns, even though future returns are, are going to be disappointing. Compensation based on assets under management uh, doesn't reward performance. Uh, well, well, it does in this case. So summary, what we see in this example, skill does last forever. Alpha to investor dies out after two weeks. Alpha is uncorrelated with skill and equilibrium. The skilled managers just get paid a lot, even though the investors aren't getting any alpha in equilibrium. The investors are perfectly rational to chase past performance. The manager, what's really going on is the manager should raise his fee to 5%. Uh, even though the state, it, rather than just charge 1% and index the rest. Uh, that, but that's the way he does it, is by bringing more assets under management. And alpha times assets under management is the right measure of skill, uh, not pure alpha. If you can earn 10 basis points on a, million, on a billion dollars, uh, call the University of Chicago with a check, because uh, that's a lot of money. Now this is, of course, the beginning of a road, not the end of a road. Uh, we've just found a, a model that seems to explain all these things, um, at least at first gasp, after 50 years of railing about irrationality. What are some of the uh, problems here? Um, Burke and Fama and French had, had a little discussion going, which you may have seen in the Fama and French paper. Um, Burke and Green's model uh, means we should see alpha before fees and no alpha after fees. Burke and Green answer that, no, no, wait a minute. Uh, the sw alpha gets swamped by indexing. Uh, in my example, the 6% alpha before fees got diluted with all the indexing until it's 1% alpha. Burke and Green write, let's measure alpha times assets under management and see there still is alpha, even though Fama and French uh, don't seem to see it. Um, Fama and French say, wait a minute, Burke's model means net alpha should be zero on average. And in fact, in Fama and French's tables, we were seeing lots of negative alphas. Burke, in a later paper with Van Binsburg, and answered that. Wait a minute, Fahm and French, if you only take out, fact, out factors like value when people knew about them and could trade them and measure alpha as assets under management, they get back to a zero net alpha, not negative net alpha that Fahm and French found. There's lots of quibbles you can have. Uh, theoretical quibbles. The story depends on the 1% fixed fee. Why not just charge a higher fee? Why not become a hedge fund? Well, maybe that's why we do have hedge funds. But you can see that there's, there's a contracting theory uh, question to be answered here. Does the full Burke and Green model match quantitatively? Do the flood flows match the Bayesian learning about skill that you have in a noisy environment? Uh, that's thesis topic for the day. 
but, but finally, we, I, I, we have a model, a promise, a, a first step down the yellow brick road. We have this puzzling data. Uh, for 45 years, we've just been railing about wasted money on active management wh while it persists. Everywhere else, we say if something persists, it must be serving some function. Let's understand it, not just, oh, active management persists because investors are being dumb. Uh, we don't allow investors or dumb story for price movements, so we shouldn't allow it for the persistence of active management. So I think this is at least a road worth pursuing. Uh, this is the first, I think, of many, many uh, interesting models.